Hello again, my name is Paul Murphy, Managing Director at Galling WLG. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back Michael Samus from Ernst & Young and John Seddon from Control Risks. Uh, and this is the second part of our discussion on the issue of country risk. In session one, we talked sort of at a high level about the issue generally and some, city, some considerations about the subject. Today, we're going to focus more on the issues related to some of the analytical tools that are used in country risk and how a country risk program can be developed by companies looking to do business in overseas jurisdictions. So sort of picking up from where we, we left off in session one, how can companies improve the way that they're assessing country risk and managing country risk? Um. Well, they can do that by um, by developing and using a country risk management program. Um, and in essence, what that does is it um, organizes, better organizes the way the company is um, assessing and ultimately integrating country risk into uh, the way it, it makes decisions, both at strategic level, so when it's making investment decisions, as well as you know, as it's managing a a range of assets um, on an ongoing basis. Um, now, the prime objectives of a country risk management program um, fundamentally to control uh, capital risk exposure um, when making that first investment, and then what is it? Well, protect uh, shareholder value um, once those investments have been made. So, protecting shareholder value on, a, on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. So looking at different stages of the investment cycle um, from final investment decision early on or even maybe before that, business development strategies for particular areas of the world and looking at some and not others, um, then analyzing a specific opportunity and then managing that opportunity going forward. How do we see a robust country risk program assisting a company throughout all those phases of the project? Well, we're really looking at, you know, a country risk man management program, you know, dealing with the full life cycle of the investment, you know, and, you know, our focal points in, in a pro pro program like this, you know, obviously you're starting off with the initial decision to invest and, in, you know, uh, questions about how do we, how do we want to structure our capital risk exposure? And, you know, that enters into questions around, you know, timeline for investments, whether you're staging investments or not. Um, also dealing with issues around, you, you know, are you going to be participating uh, in an investment with someone else? So have a, a joint venture partner and also risk transfer th possibly through different forms of financing. So those are the, you know, the upfront considerations. But, you know, once again, once in, in the country and you're operating an investment, you're going to be monitoring uh, events in the country, trying to think about how to protect shareholder value, um, developing relationships so uh, you can protect your investment and uh, you know whether it's at the local level, dealing with local communities and at the at the uh, uh, government levels at various levels of government. And then finally your, your, your risk management program is going to be have a corporate element, an aggregate element where you're considering the impact of all the different investments you have around the world and how it comes together to impact uh, the company. And this is, this is going to play out through uh, looking at various risk exposures, uh, seeing how that, uh, whether those exposures uh, breach a risk budget, um, making sure that uh, the investments you have are consistent or in align with your overall corporate strategy, and also conform to different guidelines about how you, you plan to invest in uh, different types of re different types of countries, so high risk countries, you may only take on certain types of investments. Other uh, uh, other more moderate risk countries, you you may invest differently. So we're really looking at uh, this as a as an organized activity uh, across the life cycle of an investment, and then also at the corporate level. You mentioned just now the idea of joint venture partners. How does a joint venture partner maybe help you to either assess the project opportunity or de-risk the project opportunity, um, whether it's an international joint venture partner or maybe even a local partner that you're teaming up with? 
Well, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's the issue about how much capital you want to put into your, your project. And, um, you know, for your company size, you may find that a large investment, like say, you know, some mining projects, you know, require investments of four billion, five billion, six billion, and it might be, um, you know, too large of an exposure for your company. So you maybe, uh, you know, wish to take on a joint venture partner to, you know, to, to share the risk. Uh, the other aspect is the, if you're taking on a joint venture partner, they may have relationships in country that you don't have that can help you, uh, you know, protect the project and your investment. So there's, there's a number of reasons to go forward with a, you know, a joint venture partner. Um, you know, partly it's around capital allocation and, and limiting certain exposure, but also there may be relationships that uh, your partner has that you don't that, uh, that can help you. You mentioned cash flow analysis. Um, a, a against sort of just um, the, the, the classic risk ass assessment. How do you see that companies currently assess and manage country risk versus what sort of a ro robust, a robust excuse me, CRMP program might have and, and add value for the company? Well, one of the things that you know, John and I have commented on is the you know, when we talk to you know, various companies about country risk, uh, it's one of those recurring themes, you know, you know, how do we see people out there dealing with this? And um, the approach that we often see is it's, uh, for, for a number of companies is, um, is one of gathering information through various, uh, various sources and country risk reports. But then all that information is, tends to be assimilated and then converted um, by some process into you know, uh, some adjustment to your discount rate on, on your cash flows. And so from our perspective, that's, that's fine, but we think you can go further. And that's actually look at the cash flow effects um, and you know, through various analytical tools, um, understand how that creates a risk exposure for you. And so what we see is that it's great what we're doing now, but we can go do further so we can actually generate information about risk and that can help us make better decisions about you know, how we go forward, how we invest, um, you know, and, and how much risk do we want to take on. What would be a good example of, by, by moving to this more robust analysis, something that you're picking up that might affect either your investment decision or how you manage the project that isn't maybe being captured by traditional uh, analytical techniques the companies are employing? Well, traditional techniques tend to be uh, what we term a value effect. It's country risk gets uh, recognized through a discount rate, a little bump in the discount rate, say from you know 7% to 10 and in the end, you, you, you come up with a, a value for your project uh, or profitability index, uh, various measures of the company attractiveness. Um, but the issue can be that when you're comparing different opportunities around the world, uh, you may have similar values for different projects, even though they're in very different jurisdictions. Uh, or one project might have a higher value um, and than another, but you know, and, and may on, on the surface look to be a better opportunity. What we're looking to do though, is try and understand um, the characteristics of the project and how that exposes you to country risk. So, you know, putting a large amount of capital in up front into a reasonably stable jurisdiction, but for a long time, um, that long period of investment can add a lot of risk to your project that you may not see through using a, a, a discount rate adjustment. And that can actually be riskier than putting a smaller amount of capital into to a higher risk jurisdiction. And so, you know, and it's not the case that, you know, either is better or worse, but you should understand mm -hmm. what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. And so, if, and, and then you can discuss it and make decisions in, a, in an informed manner. If we're just limiting ourselves to discount rates, we're not gonna see those sorts of effects. And so they're not going to be discussed, and uh, you know the, the quality of the decisions you're making may not be as high as you would like. And within this, I think you know, to add to what Mike is saying, that 
there's there's often a focus uh, when thinking about country risk, at just the, the sort of downside. Um, I think it's important to stress that with some of this modeling that Mike has been describing, um, that also, of course, provides opportunity to, to take advantage um, when situations change um, in the country that um, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're involved in, that provides uh, new opportunities maybe to, to change the structure of a project or to, to change the way it's being operated uh, or what have you. Um, similarly, there can sometimes be a change in dynamics between a company's sort of, uh, home country and where they're invested, and that too can present uh, some, <coughs> some opportunities. Um, and with a sort of more um, sophisticated way of looking at all these issues and, and doing so in, a, in an integrated way um, across the investment cycle, um, so not only does that help you um, better manage the, the downside of risk, but also take advantage of, uh, of the upside. So John, let's talk about a company that is looking at an opportunity in a place they've never been, mm -hmm. either the country or even the region. So they say, oh, there's opportunities in the Middle East, or there's opportunities in South America, or, or, or the, the Asian subcontinent. Um, I want to go in, but I don't know anything about that area. From a country risk perspective, what can companies do? What should they do? How do they do the country risk assessment to get um, up to speed to make an informed decision? Um, different companies will take you know, quite, quite varied approaches. Um, many will rely on a combination of, sort of home governments and sort of trade promotion agencies as well as wherever they're possibly looking to invest and national and, and sort of uh, subnational level uh, government agencies whose role it is to, to help sort of promote uh, promote investment um, there are a variety of different information sources that companies can can access um, they will typically also go on uh, trade trade missions and scouting visits and and this sort of thing um, I mean all of that is um, all of that is potentially quite quite useful. Um, where we find um, companies sometimes struggle is, is getting what is often a quite quite a wide range of stakeholders sort of comfortable with um, operating in a new region and then within a new region of the world. That is, um, which which jurisdictions um, are are most appealing for them based on um, some of the sort of macro level factors. Mm -hmm combined with the opportunities that they see there for their business, as well as um, maybe some of the constraints that are there in terms of um, who they may be able to partner with and, and so on. Now, let's flip that around. That's from the company perspective going into a jurisdiction. If you are talking to a country that is looking to expand its, its foreign investment into the country and development into the country, what can that country be thinking about or should be thinking about in terms of attracting foreign investment? Because if the companies on the one hand are doing all of this analysis for better or for worse, then clearly the jurisdiction could be doing some things as well. What should, what should countries be thinking about? Um, generally speaking, uh, and my hope is going to run through our, our discussion uh, this morning, is that companies um, we don't don't like a lot of uncertainty. Um, that uncertainty brings, brings risk, of course. Um, and so, above all else, um, a, a country who's looking to, to attract uh, more investment should be um, looking for uh, to project and, and genuinely have um, a stable investment uh, environment um, for whichever industries uh, and sectors it's looking to uh, to attract, um, additionally, sort of factors around um, you know the the, uh, the quality of, of the workforce um, and how some of these sort of permitting and so on works around bringing in expertise from abroad. I mean, there's a whole raft of, of issues, um, and I'd say it's also quite crucial to bear in mind that perceptions. Um, perceptions are quite difficult uh, to change, and so 
countries who, who have a bad reputation now, if I can be rather simplistic about it, bad reputation, um, they do seem to quite struggle at, um, at changing that and changing the perception of investors. Um, and that's probably particularly true when you know, maybe they've had a, a history of extreme corruption or conflict, that sort of thing. And even if, and then particularly so if, if they have, if they're in a, in a part of the world where those, those issues are seen as being endemic, um, rightly or wrongly, um, it's, it's tough to, to then convince foreign investors that that is a, a sort of uh, a safe bet, so to speak. Mike, we're talking about uh, implementing a, a country risk management program. What impact can that have on a company's investment portfolio? once you start moving in that direction? Well, the impact is really, you know, comes through a more, I guess you can say, more organized approach to uh, dealing with country risks. So, you know, it's going to impact the way you may think about designing your projects, um, you know, and how you commit capital into the region. So, uh, if, if country risk is an issue, quite a large issue for a country, you may thinking, be thinking about how you, you you know, you might stage investments. So you may develop a project in a manner where you're not front-loading capital, but actually um, delaying investments to see how things go. You know, later on in the project, if uh, things are going well, you can commit more capital. Um, it'll also change the way, in, you know, the way in which you think about um, how much capital to actually put into a particular project once you've figured out the design. and. You know, there there may be thinking about issues around risk sharing through alternative finance, say through streaming or uh, project finance, um, and there may also be, as we talked about a bit before, about you know joint venture partners. You know, how to how to share some of that risk, and and then lastly, it, you know, there's obviously a portfolio impact where we're going to be dealing with um, how much risk we want to take on, but also thinking about the type of projects we want to get into in the particular uh, areas in, in the world that you might want to invest in. So um, it, a lot of this just comes for a more, uh, I guess, a formal approach, a more detailed approach um, about how we go about making decisions about where to invest. Mm -hmm. So what kind of country risk analytics are, are we actually performing and at what stages are we performing those analytics? Well, really, um, what we're introducing here is an approach where we're trying to convert uh, the impact of country risk from a value effect into what we call a cash flow effect. So the idea that country risk will have an impact on your investment cash flows, and that will flow up uh, into the value of your project and up into the, uh, to the company level. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to introduce something called a country risk loss model, where we're actually thinking it in uh, country risk in terms of, you know, every year there's a potential for a, a country risk event to occur, and then if that event does occur, um, there there will be a cash flow effect, and there will be some uncertainty around just the magnitude of that. And with that type of approach, we can now use numerical techniques like simulation to actually model out and, and, and generate a wide range of cash flow effects uh, on your project across the, the life cycle as well as you know a wide range of uh, potential for, for when country risk events might occur. And that's going to give us a large amount of risk information that we can use and summarize to help us make better decisions about you know how do we structure our investments, how do we you know work with other entities, um, how does all that you know, flow up to our, our corporate level. Mm -hmm. We hear the term first of a kind risk with technology or projects and things of that nature. Do you th when we when we factor first of a kind, whether it's the project or the country or the region for a company, how does that factor into your your CRMP analytics? I mean, sometimes, frankly, you could be overly conservative about first of a kind risk. You know, depending on on where it is and how it is, other times maybe there's not enough of an appreciation of that type of thing. So how how do th things like that factor into your modeling? Well, I think you know, obviously moving into a, a new 
uh, region, it, you know, is going to have its, you know, there, there's going to be issues around, hey, we haven't been here before, um, or we haven't been into this particular region, and, uh, you know, as an industry. Um, and so that's going to have, you know, a particular impact. But the strength of having an actual formalized process, you know, a framework to work within, is that you can use that to help structure your thinking and guide you through this particular problem, you know, and actually help you understand your exposures and how you can potentially mitigate them. And so, you know, it's not like, you know, you know, yes, every country offers particular issues and things, but generally there's, you know, uh, any number of high-risk countries around the world and moderately risk countries and, and countries we consider low risk and stable. And so we can use that, you know, you know the sort of the history of the industry in those other countries to help us understand, you know, what's going to, you know, what could possibly happen if we go into new areas. So for us, you know, using this uh, structured approach has a lot of benefits because, you know, hopefully it can help you think through uh, the issues in a more structured way, and so you're more comfortable about, you know, how do we deal with a first-in-kind type of problem. And feeding into that, I think it's important that there's there's opportunities to um, use a, a detailed understanding of, of that country or that uh, that new innovation that is there um, in order to uh, determine from, from a broad range of stakeholders how that may be perceived and how um, that project may um, adversely or pos positively um, impact the, the country risk environment. Do you think that sometimes we have an undue bias and when we think about country risk is we say, well, that's the developing world. And so if I'm going into Africa or South America or Southeast Asia, well, I need to think about country risk. But if I'm in the developed world, everything's good. And then you look at something like Brexit, or you look at Trump getting elected. I mean, I think you can make the argument that country risk isn't just a developing world problem. It could be in almost any jurisdiction you're going into. Is, would you agree or disagree? I completely agree. And I would say, yes, there have been a number of, of um, major headline-grabbing um, events over the past few years in particular that probably... Um, drive that point home, but it's by no means a new mm -hmm. um, issue in uh, in developed countries. Um, it, it might maybe somewhat self-serving working for for a company called Control Risks that uh, we say that risk is everywhere. Um, but I think it, if if one looks at it objectively, um, that is very very true. Um, and so, for instance, in in Canada, which uh, most most people uh, around the world would probably consider to be one of the most stable uh, countries, mm -hmm. um, and it is certainly. Um, but that's not to say that um, there aren't sometimes issues that, that companies come across, um, particularly when considering um, larger sort of capital uh, projects with with a you know complicated uh, complicated issues between different levels of government, for instance. Um, and understanding how the interplay of some of those can can have a, an impact on the uh, on the project. So when we're building these 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 country risk management programs, what are the the inputs that go into this sort of analytically, and then how do you assess the importance of those maybe data driven inputs versus? call it boots on the ground, sort of having somebody in the country that understands the country, that has the sense of things, knows the right people to talk to, you know, understands that maybe what's in the press story isn't really an accurate reflection of things. How do you balance the two of those and what different values do they create within the larger program? Well, we'd say that those two elements should be, should be integrated. So you could sort of think about it in, in terms of top down and, and bottom up, um, but that would suggest that maybe there's a disconnect there, which isn't what we would what we would suggest uh, one does. Um, so different stages in in the um, in in an investment decision 
um, and, and diligence uh, process. Um, varying levels of depth would probably be warranted. Um, and certainly that sort of macro level view may be sufficient, um, probably would be sufficient um, in the very early stages. Um, but typically, you know, what, what you referred to as a sort of boots on the ground, um, typically that, that can be quite invaluable in um, understanding some of the real nuances around um, specifics to do with an industry, the local region, uh, um, a, a variety of factors, whoever it is, maybe your perceptions of, a, of your partners or maybe perceptions of um, contractors who, who uh, a company is working with. Um, both positive and, and negative, um, and understanding what um, what sort of rumors uh, could adversely affect um, uh, an operation. You know, that's that's pretty important too. Even if even if it is just to understand that those sort of reputational issues are there in the marketplace and maybe um, maybe things that need to be managed uh, going forward. The other thing to remember is. The, you know, there. You can actually use the qualitative and the quantitative to reinforce each other. Um, the issue with modeling is you can build a model that you fall in love with and think this is the answer to everything, and so it's important to step back and have, you know, uh, some understanding of the, the underlying structure of you know how you see country at risk playing out and it, its potential cash flow effects, and. The way you can do that is by, you know, having that that behavior reviewed by people who are experienced in country and saying, does this sort of behavior actually make some sense? And so, you know, the idea here is that they should be working together, you know, and complementing each other and supporting each other. John, you mentioned that concept of reputational risk, which maybe is a little bit different than classic political risk, government action, those types of things, but just the, do I want to do this project because of reputational factors to my corporate brand? How does that factor into all of this? And what level of importance do you see companies putting on that? And do you see attitudes changing? Um, there, is, there is a fair bit of, of focus on it, perhaps not quite as much as some would think. Um, what I'm, what I was referring to it a moment ago, I was thinking primarily at sort of a local level, how a, um, how a project or company might be perceived at mm -hmm. local level, and how that may um, positively or negatively um, impact the ability of the company to execute its its project. Um, and so, I'm not thinking so much specifically about bad press, so to speak, but rather um, operational delays and this sort of thing. Um, that can result from, from some of these, uh, these reputational issues. Mm -hmm. But we do see activist shareholders and, and NGOs being, it seems like, especially on issues like climate issues, mm -hmm. you know, a coal plant, things yeah. of that nature that, that become targets um, in terms of, of what companies are doing or may be planning to do that then get blocked. And I would think that, that factoring in those, those macro reputational issues might might be important as well. They, they certainly are and companies that, that we work with you know, often will say that it's a challenge to uh, keep up on what is um, what they feel is a, a ever broadening array of different indicators that they need to uh, stay on top of and ensure that they um, have adequate means to sort of incorporate those into their into their models and their reporting as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about risk budgeting. What what exactly is that, and and how does that factor into the overall corporate planning process? Um, well, risk management really should be an integral part of uh, strategy formulation for for a company uh, or a project. Um, and so, as as part of that, um, you know. Essentially, uh, and, and to put it, I think quite quite simply, um, an, organization, an organization needs to determine how much risk it's willing to take, um, and how much risk it's willing to to accept. Um, and so, by defining by defining that, basically creating a, a risk budget, um, and understanding and, and communicating what the organization's risk appetite is, 
um, then you can ensure that, um, that an appropriate amount of risk is, is taken that, again, sort of ties back to the strategy of, of the organization. Um, and we'd say that for country risk factors, the, the basic sort of approach is no different to, to any other. Um, and in fact, country risk should be wholly aligned with how other risk factors are, are considered. The, the other thing to remember as well about risk budgeting it, is it's a process of, of how to discipline the way you allocate capital. And, and, and that's a, a really important thing because you may see a really great investment opportunity somewhere and it's going to require a certain amount of capital investment. And you're thinking, well, what a great way to expand the company. But, you know, the question comes back is, you know, are we taking on too much? And so potentially with risk budgeting and through an enterprise risk management uh, program, uh, this will allow you to step back and make some, some choices. You know, and this can feed into, you know, how do we, you know, yes, it's a great opportunity, we want to be there, but how do we best do it to make sure that this opportunity is aligned with, with the way we want the company to go? So we've had two sessions now on the subject of country risk, and you know I thank you for your comments, but if someone's listening to all of this and they say, well, these guys sound like they know what they're talking about, um, I'd like to, to work with them more. How do each of your companies respectively engage on this on a daily basis with projects or with various, you know, historical clients of the firm. What are you actually doing? How are you brought into the process? And are you also seeing that evolve over time? No, no first John. <laughs> um, well, Control Risks, we have um, one of the largest uh, teams of, of political risk analysts in the industry who are um, working on a daily basis um, with um, with clients across all industry sectors, um, and they're working from you know, major centers around the world, both in the developed world, um, if I can put it that way, and, and, and you, were, you were talking about risk in the developed world, as well as in some of the most interesting and high growth um, emerging and frontier markets. Um, and in essence, what we do is, is help um, organizations understand um, some of the risks that they're, that they're facing, um, and that can be at sort of macro level, country risk level, as well as risks associated with um, some of the specific projects they're working on and counterparties. Um, and then beyond just helping them understand what the risk is, we help them develop um, frameworks to manage that. And um, if, or I should say when, they have issues, um, as, as problems and challenges associated with, um, with country risk factors, we help them manage those issues through. And Mike? Yeah, so, uh, Ernst & Young, we have a, a, a group out of New York, a geopolitical strategy group that uh, helps you know, businesses uh, understand uh, the impact of political events on their, uh, on their businesses. So, for example, Brexit and you know, investments in England and how that may potentially impact uh, your business going forward. Um, on my side, I have a team here in Toronto where uh, we are actively mo modeling uh, investments, um, you know, the, the essentially dynamic cash flow modeling, looking at uh, various risk, risk exposures for investments, particularly in the natural resource sectors, um, where we're dealing with commodity prices, uh, uncertainty, uh, foreign exchange, uh, energy uh, uncertainty. And then on top of that, we will layer on uh, country risk. and seeing how that impacts an investment. And we do that at um, you know, an initial stage, so when you're dealing with the, the initial investment. Uh, also for existing invest, uh, operations where you might be thinking of uh, making another investment in that, and then also bringing that up to uh, the corporate level. So we, we tend to deal a lot more with the quantitative modeling of these issues and uh, generating information about risk exposure. So decision makers can, can be comfortable in the decisions that they make around the way they allocate capital. And from a corporate perspective, I guess for both of you, it's both, to, to be effective, you're looking at things both at a project level, but then at more of a portfolio or industry or regional level, because as, as we've talked about over these last two sessions, if we're looking at 
risk on an individual project that has to be filtered into the company's overall risk profile and how that project fits within the larger pic for the picture for the company. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, yeah. Okay. That's exactly it. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, listen, thank you both for your time. And, and hopefully everyone's found this to be very interesting. I know I certainly have, but I really appreciate your time and, and your comments. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.